Hey there. Thanks for joining me. I'm Della Rucker. I am the principal of the Wise Economy Workshop and author of the book, The Local, there it is, The Local Economy Revolution Has Arrived, What's Changed, and How You Can Help. Available wherever you get your books, digital or print. So it has been a little bit since I've done one of these readings. Um, the summer ended up being a little more uh, busy and a little more chaotic than I was expecting it to be. Hmm. We just got back. You may have seen from a video I did last week. We, uh, My husband and I just got back from a week in Door County, Wisconsin, which was lovely. The only downside was that I scratched my eye on the way up and ended up spending a couple hours in urgent care and all of that kind of thing. And so I had to wear my glasses and I was squinting and like it was it was it wasn't quite optimal, but I got nothing to complain about. Everything went lovely and um it's all better. So somehow my eyes seem to be like an issue with these videos. Either I'm getting like random sinus pink eye things or I'm clawing myself in the face. I, I don't know. Um, but so gave a couple of updates, um, in that video, one of them was about a, um, an interview that I did as part of a celebration for Trep House, which is the virtual super fund, virtual super fund. That's a thing you use for environmental cleanup. It is not a super fund. It's a virtual super hub for what we call new majority founders who are black and other kinds of underrepresented um, um, entrepreneurs and small business owners who are looking for a community and a collection of resources that will help them get to their next level. So we had a fabulous conversation um, with a couple of my just people I just love being with and talking to and learning from. Um, that was yesterday. You could find it live on uh, this Facebook channel or a YouTube channel, and it will or LinkedIn. If you go back into the LinkedIn history, you'll find the the recording of the live stream there, and we'll have a cleaned up version um, available in the near future. So that was a blast. That was a lot of fun. Um, at Trap House, we have been steadily working away at networks and making amazing connections with people who are just doing mind-blowing stuff all over the country. And you'll be starting to hear more and more about those soon. We've also been doing a complete revamp of the Trap House website and Trap House systems. We built, you know, the initial stuff last year and um, it was already time for a little upgrading. So uh, we've been working hard on that at Trap House. If you're interested in being a sponsor or if you're um, sympathetic to that new majority population, if you get new majority um, and you're interested in being a mentor, a coach or a vendor, we would love to hear from you. So drop me a note. Tomorrow, probably tomorrow. I will be putting out the next edition of the Wise Economy Telescope, which is my Substack newsletter that collects stories that you might have missed that are giving us early indications of where the new economy, what I often call the fusion economy that we're moving into as we come out of the industrial era, where that's going and how that's likely to impact all of us and our communities as we're moving forward. So we're moving into a very uh, unusual a world that's different from where we've been before. And it's coming on us fast. So we need all the help we can get to get ready for it. So that's what the Wise Economy Telescope is about. If you're interested and you sign up, it's a, a great deal, super cheap. Wise Economy dot com forward slash substack wise economy actually it's substack forward slash what it's one of those 
if you search Wise Economy Substack, you're going to find it. And I just realized I have a testimonial to my mother going today. I have this funky little thing. Sorry, I just <laughs> squirrel ran off onto something else. This is hysterical. My mother. So as many of you know, my mother um, doesn't know where it wants to go. My mother passed um, a long time ago. Uh, it's been about 15 years now. And so um, I don't encounter like reminders of her on a regular basis. Uh, that was funny to me because immediately what I heard in my head was a poem that she used to recite to me all the time. And I've had curly hair all my life. And she would look at me and she would say, there was a little girl who had a little curl right in the middle of her forehead. And when she was good, she was very, very good. And when she was bad, she was horrid. So I don't know if I, was, I don't know if she was trying to tell me that I was being horrid. I don't think I was horrid, but you know, I, I could probably you know pull out that streak every so often if uh, if the opportunity arose. So so come to think of it, I'm not sure what she was telling me by uh, repeating that, but I will never forget that poem. So. Speaking of things that we never forget and stick with us for a very long time, today's reading or today's selection from the Local Economy Revolution Has Arrived is from a chapter about building culture. And this chapter talks specifically about the, the public sector context, about building culture around how a government or an agency and the public interact with each other. And that's super important to me. I think that's one of the, the components of how we do planning and economic development and urban revitalization and downtown revitalization and all of this stuff. It's, it's one of the pieces that is most important but gets often the least attention from us. And so a lot of my writing and work over the last many years has been about that topic of how do we do the the job of working with, I hate saying public engagement because I feel like that term's been sort of bastardized, but how do we do that work of collaborating with the community when we're in any kind of role of leadership, whether that's as an elected or appointed official, as a um, a leader of a, an organization, like a nonprofit, or whether that's just as a person who's trying to make good stuff happen in their community. So here's the selection. There is a story at the beginning that is from an old Onion article that I love, but I'm going to skip it for the time being. So if you want to read a wonderful story about the New Bedford High School Auditorium and the public engagement, the one on there, which devolves into chaos. Pick up the book. It'll be in there. All right. In 2013, my son, that's my older son, who's now 23, started a new high school. After a lot of deliberation, my husband and I decided to acquiesce to the kids' request to attend an academically rigorous private high school. The kid was accepted in January. By the time he starts school in August, again, 2013, he will have had one Saturday morning with the music program, a one-on-one -on -one with an assistant principal, two weeks of band camp, and a two-day freshman orientation. He had the meeting with the assistant principal last Saturday. It was not what I expected. There's my 14-year-old sitting across a conference table from a massive, intimidating-looking man, 300 pounds of tie you in a pretzel if you mess up. Generally, that's a good trait in an assistant principal, as I'm thinking as the former substitute teacher turned mom. The assistant principal places a binder full of information in front of my kid. Mr. Intimidating then starts asking James questions. Now, note, he had already been accepted. 
the questions start off with unsurprising stuff. What's your favorite subject in school? What do you do outside of school? Easy stuff for a 14-year-old kid to answer. Then the questions take a surprising turn. What kind of situations stress you out? How do you deal with stress? What are you passionate about? What gets you out of bed in the morning? If I asked your best friend to describe you, what would you what would that person say? Find yourself a 14-year-old boy and try those questions on him. Or try them yourself. James stumbled through the questions and Mr. Intimidating took notes. Then the assistant principal asks James, my son, to open the binder. Sitting to the side, I steel myself for a marginally painful review of rules and regulations and consequences. Instead, Mr. Intimidating spends the next 20 minutes conversing with 14-year-old James about the core principles of the school's philosophy. Critical thinking, self-awareness, compassion towards others, integrity, deep stuff, foundational stuff, not a single rule or regulation. As I listened, it dawned on me that this was not a one-off thing. It was just more obvious because of that setting. When my son did the music department event a couple of weeks ago, the entire group of kids ended by singing the alma mater. The incoming freshmen put arms around each other's shoulders, exactly the way the upperclassmen do, even though they'd never met any of those kids before that day. While they tried to read the words off of a piece of paper. You go find yourself a 14 year old boy and try to get to them to put their arms around the shoulder of another boy. Good luck. And yet, I watched my kid do exactly that. So think for a moment about how we complain about how the public gets itself involved or doesn't get involved in our planning and economic development and local economy and local government in person or online. We gripe that they don't behave themselves, that they say nasty things or they get off topic, they pound soapboxes or worse, they just don't show up. It's no wonder our public meetings are so miserable. It's all their fault. Now, think for a minute about how much effort we've put into establishing our community's culture of public engagement. What have we and our predecessors done to convey, to demonstrate what effective public engagement looks like? What have we done to set the tone, to establish the environment that will allow us to do something beneficial together? Do we even know what that public engagement would look like? Or would we sound like a 14 year old trying to answer a question about how his best friend would describe him? What public engagement culture do we have? If all James's high school did was a 20 minute discussion of principles, I would never expect it to take. A 14 year old would forget that stuff before he got out the door. But when every aspect 
of the culture reinforces those principles. Alma mater sung with arms around each other, freshmen applauded by upperclassmen when they enter the assembly on the first day of school. Then it's not just words, they're building a culture. So put aside all that idealistic stuff about public engagement for a minute. Transparency, democratic process, people have a right to know, yada, yada, yada. Got it. Now, for a moment, be purely selfish. The fact of the matter is that we screw ourselves over when we don't have those conversations, when we don't build meaningful collaboration right from the beginning. We make the whole process of doing what we're trying to do 47 times harder on ourselves than it should be. The simple fact of the matter is that you know there's stuff that your community needs to deal with and not dealing with it is compacting your budgets and your staff and your time to the point where the most basic parts of the job get harder and harder. You need things to change. Better tax base, more efficient land use, less money getting sucked up into roads or pipes or programs that aren't generating a decent return on investment. And you know that this is the case all over. So job hunting or moving to a different town, it doesn't get you out of the mess. People who don't stand in your shoes are not going to see the emerging issues that are self-evident to you. They're not going to intuitively understand what you're seeing any better than you're going to be able to anticipate what 3D printing will enable 10 years from now. And it's a psychological fact that when people don't have good information to work from, they over-rely on their past experience. It worked fine, just fine, 10 years ago. Just do it some more. That's not an age issue or a gender issue. It's a human condition issue. And the only way to counteract that bias, that the future should look like the present, is to give our rational minds the information they need to shift their gears. So why do most communities fail to have intelligent conversations, there's a word, intelligent conversations about their futures? We have a tendency to assume that the public won't listen to reason. We point to lots of situations where residents say stupid things or make assumptions that, given the more extensive level of information we have to work with, just don't make sense. Even though we told them what the facts were, they chose not to listen. Now, good teachers know that just telling someone something verbally doesn't mean that it will stick. That's why teachers don't tell you something once. You hear it in a lecture, you read it in a book, you do a project, you write a paper. People need to interact with new information on multiple levels and do that over time. If you want someone to understand something, just telling it to them, it doesn't cut it. And yet in local government, most of the time, that's all we do. Or in other kinds of organizations as well. No wonder that public can't mentally shift away from the status quo. No wonder they don't see the threats and the opportunities that we know about. A fundamental purpose of our approach has to change. We have to become 
managers and facilitators of community conversations. Not just presentation givers, open house when all the but, but, words. We're going to try that sentence again. We have to become, it seemed like a good idea when I wrote it. Obviously, I didn't read it aloud at that point. We're going to try this again. We have to become managers and facilitators of community conversations. Not just presentation givers, open house when the plan is all but done holders, grouse helplessly to each other when they don't get it first. We can't keep falling back on, well, it's complicated. You wouldn't understand. Trust us. And then wonder why people don't see the need for change and don't trust us. Edward Deming, who's often the, called the father of modern manufacturing, gets quoted in business schools every day. Culture eats strategy for breakfast and process for lunch. In 2011, I wrote a blow-by-blow -blow account of how I managed a potentially contentious public meeting. That post has now been read by several thousand people. Obviously, that essay addressed something that a lot of people needed or wanted. By keeping a meeting, but keeping a meeting from blowing up, that's just classroom management. That's the very basics. It's not creating a constructive environment. It's not enabling a constructive culture. It's not in itself moving us forward at all. We have to change the culture of community participation, and we have to do it from top to bottom. Organizations that take on culture change know that they have to do it intentionally. They have to build it into every interaction, every communication. They need to continuously reinforce the principles of the culture they want not just by saying what those principles are, but by living them through every interaction. So what are your community's public interactions telling people about how you want to relate to them? What does your room setup say? What does your website design say? What are the rules or the, um, the lack of rules, the options and the opportunities for involvement? Is meaningful public engagement built into your processes from beginning to end? How do you involve people upstream in setting policies and deciding priorities? Do people have real opportunities to be part of the solution or do you just invite them in when there is a fait accompli to argue against? Do you give them the ability to do something other than just say no, no, no? Do you channel them into being part of the solution? Now, if you don't, don't despair. Culture change is a long and difficult process. That's why my son's new school starts on this work long before they get their books and why they build it all the way through their experience. The more I think about it, the more I suspect it's not luck. It's intentional. Now, like most analogies, this one breaks down. A 14-year-old, to at least some extent, goes where you tell him to go and does what you tell him to do. 
especially when the person telling them is a 300 pound assistant principal. But your residents will participate this way only if they perceive that the value of doing so will exceed the cost of their time and their energy, which makes a culture of meaningful public engagement all the more important. So you might as well get started. Ask yourself, what would meaningful public engagement look like here? What do we need to learn from our residents? What do we want our public meetings to look like, to feel like? What character, what principles do we want? How can we build that into everything we do? It won't happen overnight. But goofy 14-year-old boys don't turn into men overnight either. So go ahead and get started. So again, that was a selection from Local Economy Revolution Has Arrived, What's Changed, and How You Can Help. It's over here. The Local Economy Revolution Has Arrived, What's Changed, and How You Can Help. Available online or by bookstore order, print or digital, wherever you like to get your books. So thanks again for joining me today. I am grateful, as always, for your giving me a little bit of your time. And so until I see you again in a few days, let's go get them.